Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Nick Gowing, uh, and it's good to see you all uh, and also to, to join in this important discussion with something which many of you will be anguishing over yourselves. What is the global economic outlook? And importantly, what is the Indian economic outlook at the moment? Uh, I need to underscore um, just how uh, uncertain so many things are. Uh, we're talking about the world facing existential threats at present, not just from COVID and more than 4 million people who've died so far. But we're also facing incredible pressures now on the climate emergency. Look what's happening in Maharashtra. Look at what's been happening in Henan province in the People's Republic of China. Look at what's happened in Central Europe, focused on Germany, on Luxembourg, uh, on parts of uh, the Czech Republic, on Belgium as well. And look at the extraordinary heat dome that we've been seeing in the United States. And all this is having its own effect. As um, uh, Chancellor Merkel said after she'd visited what happened in uh, Western Germany, words cannot really describe the enormity of what's happened. But of course, that's in Germany. Look at what's happening in so many other places like Bangladesh, like Vietnam, like the um, where the inundations are taking place with greater frequency as we're seeing in Maharashtra uh, at the moment. But th that is the setting for the uncertainties that we all face, where many people, many businesses are doing well. Many businesses have come through the pandemic. They've created new stability. They've created new liquidity. They've created new, uh, new business opportunities. They've strengthened and they've broadened and deepened exactly what they were doing. And they've been very imaginative. Others, many SMEs particularly, are struggling for simply survival. Therefore, the climate emergency and what has happened in COVID-19, and the fact is the World Health Organization says that we're going to have to live with COVID-19 indefinitely, as, as we do with flu, even with all the, 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 the tragedies uh, that we are likely to face. So that's the kind of background, and I'm hoping that I'll have a panel of four, but so far I only have a panel of two. Um, let me introduce them. Uh, you'll, you'll know uh, both of them, but let me introduce Rajiv Kaur, who's past president of AMA and also chairman of the NICO group. Rajiv, welcome. And also Vijay Eswaran, who's chairman of the QI group, uh, which is in Hong Kong and also uh, Kuala Lumpur as well. But uh, Rajiv, for those who are not totally familiar with the NICO group and what you're doing, just give me 30 seconds of what you do and what the spread of your interest is. Well, uh, we build and run theme parks, that's one of our businesses. And the other is engineering services, where we uh, go and try and fix things in uh, places like refineries, power plants, etc. And is business good at the moment? Is business um, clear for you? Well, uh, the engineering business is back on track. And uh, I think we are, we, although there is COVID, there is the end of the second wave in India, but our business is doing okay. Uh, on the theme parks at the moment it's closed for the second time so oh, clearly <laughs> we, we can't be doing well and you've been relying on your reserves to keep them going absolutely you, uh, with, with, uh, with sort of God's blessings and perhaps uh, good management we had built up a lot of cash reserves and those reserves uh, have come in handy BJ, um, as I said, uh, you, Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, uh, but you, you are very much focused on retail globally. Yes. Um, in essence, we began as an e-commerce platform way back in 98. And uh, just about the time that uh, uh, the Hong Kong handover was happening. So we came in at a very interesting time. And uh, we built an e-commerce platform that is now currently across the five continents, we have 43 offices across the world. We've expanded into hotels and we've gone into uh, multimedia. We've gone into a whole range of other, including watch manufacturing, uh, nutrition, health, and so on. So, but the fundamental basis of the group is still and always has been the e-commerce platform. And tell me, what, what's your view of where the way the market's going at the moment? Retail, again, very quickly, if you can. Well, at the beginning um, of the pandemic, um, you know, we were pretty much shaken up uh, as we did not know what to expect. Like most other, uh, you know, companies in the industry, we, we had to go through a total paradigm shift. Uh, we had to realign a lot of departments. Uh, we had to get leaner and we had to also at the same time 
uh, end up anticipating what this new norm would be like. Uh, the surprise was that uh, towards maybe four or five months into the pandemic, sometime in the middle of last year, we were adapting fast enough to catch an upward trend in the e-commerce platforms across the world, including ours. So our sales have actually, you know, um, started picking up again. We have beefed up a lot of apartments and uh, we are meeting uh, the sales uh, targets that we had set. Uh, and so I think we are one of the more fortunate ones, so to speak, for the new norm certainly is all about e-commerce. All right. Well, let, let me just check what you mean by the new norm. Rajiv, what for the Nico Group is the new norm? Have you yet defined it or is the new norm simply agility, flexibility and uh, the ability particularly to adapt and build and be opportunistic? I, I think, uh, yes, it is to, uh, to build and to uh, readjust to the new life where traveling is greatly reduced. Now, let me tell you, that has greatly helped the bottom lines of many, many companies and organizations, hugely, right? Uh, in fact, one of the reasons uh, why our profitability in our engineering business is, in a way, not only protected, but improved marginally, is because the travels have come down. But that is not a sustainable model, because we also find that we are continuing with our existing customers. But to build new customers we've not been able to find a solution using the video as yet, right? So uh, that, that is one thing. But having said that, it's made life a lot easier. Uh, maybe not uh, as friendly, but uh, sitting at home or sitting in the office uh, with a computer or laptop in front of you, uh, I find it that it's using the human touch. Uh, but it's making it more convenient for, for people uh, to stay at home and to do their work and also spend more time with the family. So let, let, me, let me just check that one important thing that you said again with what Vijay said. Video does not work when you're trying to build new customers. What does that mean? What are the implications for you? I'm, I'm saying for my business, right? For Vijay's business, it'll probably be wrong. And let me tell you why. Because I never ever in my life pre-pandemic was buying uh, stuff on the internet, right? Now I go on to Big Basket, I go on to Spencer's, and I'm buying stuff, you know, whether it's a shaving cream or whether it's toothpaste, that's what I'm doing. So uh, Vijay, I don't know why he was completely, really his business should be booming as we see uh, the uh, Unilever business in India, they, they, they're really having their best quarters ever. They just want their good quarters. Well, let's, I, I, check, let's check with Vijay, Vijay. <laughs> I um, I wasn't complaining, but the fact of the matter is we did have to adjust to it. Like everyone else within the industry, the first couple of months, we were pretty wary as, uh, you know, we were still very much retail uh, on the ground. But uh, actually, this is a generational gap issue, Nick. Primarily, the millennials, the centennials, the Gen A, they were born, you know, doing this stuff. And uh, they just dived into it, uh, you know, like fish in water. They they loved it. So basically, our market, you know, demographics have changed. There's no uh, there's no discounting that fact. The the matter we have reached out more into uh, the millennial centennial markets than ever before, and we have restructured our marketing strategies to meet that. But let, been, let, let me be clear, VJ. You use the phrase "new norm." Yes. Is there really a new norm or is the new norm simply uncertainty but new opportunities at the same time? The way that one of the ways that I have described the new norm in various other forums uh, within the last few months has been that it has in effect speeded up what would have taken another 10 or 15 years to happen. The millennials and centennials were already you know, uh, spending more of the time on smartphones and connect, you know, interconnecting with each other, buying stuff, doing all of the things that right now, for instance, Rajiv has been pulled into doing, you know, just like he's getting his shaving cream online, delivered, you know, which is something he wouldn't have thought about. However, this is something that the generations now following us, you know, his, his granddaughter is, is his uh, guide at the moment, I would say, you know, and this is nothing unusual. In many households. Is that right, Rajiv, that your granddaughter is your guide? 
Absolutely. She, she set this up for me because I'm used to only the iPad and the iPhone, all right? And uh, run the world. Uh, they, they, they've, uh, over the four years, despite many suggestions, have not become friendly to iPads and iPhones. Let me check with you on your, your theme parks. Presumably, though, you cannot have virtual theme parks. So that is a significant um, challenge for you about how you adapt that to this new reality. Yeah, the, the revenue model uh, is really come very badly uh, unstuck. Right? Uh, so that, that, is, that is very true. And uh, uh, the only thing one can do, we are, we are not doing it for various other reasons, but many people in the industry have started giving uh, delivery, food delivery, for example. Right? And uh, many people have been using the social media to keep uh, the their mind share alive in people, you know, so that when things open up, uh, they do that. Uh, uh, they do that in very interesting fashions and novel fashions. So we are doing that as well, but, uh, but we are not doing food delivery, which is definitely a way where you can get uh, sort of revenues flowing in. Now, can I just pause one moment, because I should say, Vijay and uh, Rajiv, that we hoped to be joined by Ashish Chawan, who's Managing Director and uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Bombay Stock Exchange. Haven't yet seen him. I hope, uh, Ashish, if you're trying to join, please do. And also Prakash Hinduja, Chairman of Europe uh, for the Hinduja Group. So please, if you want to or can join me for the next uh, half an hour of discussion, I'm waiting for you and I'll be delighted to see you. Vijay. If I may just interject, actually, uh, Rajiv and I uh, had a little chat while we were getting prepared for this session. And in the course of that discussion, I, I got to know about the theme park businesses that which, you know, is his uh, main forte. And, and in my mind, uh, you know, a theme park business is all about an experience. And uh, in fact, you know, after this, Rajiv and I sit down and brainstorm a little bit, you know, today, Gaming is a, is a seriously big business. And a lot of kids today, you know, theme parks were probably, you know, in a way, uh, a generational uh, trend. And one that, you know, Disneyland perhaps began a couple of decades ago. But heading into the future, uh, you're going to see kids putting on, you know, these huge goggles that gives them everything from a space experience to walking on the, you know, floor of the uh, sea or the ocean. So they have all of this experiences that can be built onto a gaming gaming platform and uh, it is it is probably the theme park of the future a virtual theme park if you like well actually uh, it's the other way around what we are doing in theme park vijay is we are giving them these goggles right so we are giving them an additional experience which they've never had before so you're oh, going yeah. a, 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 onto a say a roller coaster you're having these goggles on and you're getting an experience which is truly mind-blowing Truly mind blowing. Wow. Wow. So, uh, you know, as, as far as the gaming goes, yes, that's a, that's definitely a trend. Kids are spending much more time, even well before the pandemic, on games, right? And I don't think that was any real threat because people still want to go out. You know, we were closed for five months, then we were allowed to open, and when we opened, the the footfall that we got, the visitor level that we got. In the month of December and January, which was two months after we opened, was higher than the previous full year, proper year, pre-pandemic year. So there is a, a pent-up demand, and we are seeing that in tourism, where, where you know Himachal Pradesh, Nick, uh, if you're not familiar, and for those who are from Europe, that's a, a hill station which is very popular uh, for with Indians during the summer when it's very hot in Delhi and other places. So. They said anyone who has had two shots can come up or if they can come up with a, with a test, uh, a test done within 72 hours before. And there were traffic jams on the road for people going there, uh, literally traffic jams. So there's a huge pent up demand for people to go out. We, right? we see that as well in, in our own, you know, uh, the, within the concept of the e-commerce, e what we call revenge buying, you yeah. know. So there's revenge buying right now, a new term, so to speak. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean, uh, Vijay? Revenge. Well, it means that you, you've got a whole, you've got lots of cash 
you know, basically stocked up at home for whatever reason. You know, you're not spending as much on a whole bunch of other things. And you're waiting. You are basically yearning to go out there and buy stuff that you miss an entire different lifestyle. So when the pendulum swings back, when things were looking effectively normal, people want basically dashed out to buy. So this revenge buying is something that's going to happen in, uh, in real estate. It's going to happen, you know, in retail. It's going to definitely happen with the theme parks. So, you know, the new norm, as it were, will definitely have to predict and, pre, you know, to welcome this because that's, yeah. that's going to be something new. Let me encourage questions from out there for the next uh, half an hour, for the half an hour of our session. But I want to push you both, and hopefully the other panelists, if they join us as well, where is this going to create wealth? Because you have the 6% growth in India, you have 7% inflation. Where is the new wealth going to come from? Where is the new uh, accelerator, the new engine room of the economy going to come from, particularly for the next gen, Rajiv? Uh, Nick, see, uh, if I may uh, sort of just submit, uh, Nick, that when you talk about the inflation uh, of 7% and growth of 6%, let me tell you the growth is going to be real growth, adjusted after inflation. So otherwise, the, the, the total growth would be 7 plus, 7 plus 6, 13%. All right. So I, just to clarify that. But I mean, that's the only thing that I was wanted to clarify that the growth, let's put it this way, if in this quarter figures are not yet adjusted in our first quarter of this financial year, if our growth is going to be, let's say, 18% over the previous quarter and inflation is, is 7%, then the 7% is per annum, so you've got to divide it by 4, but the real growth will be, I mean, the, the total growth, actual growth will it's, be 20%. If it's, you don't still something, it's still something that's going to require some changes in strategy. India per se has to recognize. So the I, I think what you need to see there, Vijay, is if you take the real growth, our real growth of population is around about 1.8. So if our real growth is say uh, 2.8, then we are we kind of quits. I mean, our people is not getting any better off. But if if our growth rates are say 6 percent, which we really in industry hope it will be much more ultimately. Uh, then even then our people will be getting... I, 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 I accept that. However, here's what I think perhaps we need to understand. India is sitting on the crossroads of Asia, so to speak. And its greatest value or assets will be in developing this crossroads, making use of it, yeah. building its backyard, which is, you know, ASEAN, opening up the African continent. Uh, you know, the China's Belt and Silk Road initiative is something India can definitely... Uh, you know, use as its own initiative because India's legacy had spread from Africa all the way up to the Philippines, going back, you know, a couple of thousand years. So its its trade, its history, its traditions are in, in fact imprinted all across this. And this is an asset that India needs to leverage upon. Rajiv, let, 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 let me just pause for a moment because you can see that Ashish has joined us, yeah, Managing Director yeah, yeah. and yes. CEO of the Bombay Stock Exchange. Welcome, Ashish. Um, it's you. great to see you. What I thought is I'd let you listen in for the first, last three or four minutes before introducing you, and we have 25 minutes to run. And what, what we've been trying to do is grasp the nettle of where business is changing, where the opportunities are, where the big problems and challenges are. And perhaps if I can ask you, if you're settled in now, if you can give us an idea of what you're seeing on the stock exchange and what the data is indicating to you about where both the Indian economy and more broadly the global economy is going. Welcome. And uh, maybe if you could just give us a couple of minutes on that. No more for the moment. No, thank you, Nick. I think... Um uh, where we are uh, sitting, uh, we look at uh, the economy in a different way, probably. Uh, what we have seen uh, over the last 25, 30 years is uh, that uh, across the world, industry has actually gone to China and the services are slowly coming to India. Uh, of course, the pharmaceuticals and other things, India is doing well. So one is the, uh, the economy's own uh, sort of engine. And the second part is uh, the engine of the rest of the world, which are kind of India services. And that's where uh, probably the world is currently uh, slowly trying to come out of the different waves that COVID is giving. Uh, 
but uh, overall india has done exceedingly well compared to the expectations uh, given india per capita gdp of 2000 dollars per uh, person and us is 66000 dollars per person uh, at the same time us is on per million basis around 100 uh, us is on 20th number number 20 and india is around 109th on per million infection and per million deaths so effectively the europe and us are doing reasonably badly compared to india despite india's uh, per capita income being so low and that's what is your explanation for that i think either india is not as poor as we may, we think it is or the world is not as rich as it uh, we think it is effectively india has done very well uh, in the covid period and it has run the world by uh, providing the back office support uh, and also the it support to the world uh, in fact all banks all uh, malls all um, retailers across the world work despite the uh, covid is because of india and that's where i think uh, because of the vaccines medicines as well as uh, the way india has managed the world's it I think uh, somewhere on the line, I am very, very hopeful about the way India is going to uh, go forward uh, with the rest of the world. It has also engaged during the same period in Quad. Uh, it, in the last 74 uh, years since its independence, India was on the wrong side of history. Now it is uh, coming to the right friends and right side of history. So overall, I think geopolitically and economically, India is going to do well. The world uh, is, of course, uh, going to uh, sort of go into different phases uh, even for next one or two years by the time we settle down. But India is going to lead the world in a variety of ways, including the medicine. Lead the world. Lead the world. Yes. I mean, forgive me. Well, no, you'll understand this, but I feel I've heard this before about India. And I don't mean, I mean this in a positive way. Great ambition, great intentions, great expectations. And then it begins to get um, problematic. There's a stalling, and I'm looking at the latest um, numbers from the last week for the BSE, but it does look as if it's very buoyant at the moment. I've been standing outside your building when there's been a, a significant crash, particularly obviously after 10 years ago. Is this sustainable? Is it, is, it, is it backed by fundamentals or is it backed by opportunism at the moment? Uh, I would say both. Uh, opportunism as well as fundamental. Fundamental in the sense that uh, the richness of the hard infrastructure, that's ports, electricity generation, uh, all those things, you know, uh, the hard things which you sort of admire, the beauty part of it, uh, and the soft infrastructure. India has actually moved uh, into 21st century in the soft infrastructure in terms of its e-governance, in terms of fintech, in terms of the way it manages governance, including providing subsidy to its people, free food to its people. It's done all through uh, something called Jandan Agar Mobile. So this time, uh, in a way, it's very, very solid ground. At the same time, if opportunity comes, one should take it up. Rather than saying, no, it will be called opportunism. That's why we shouldn't do it. India has actually been uh, embarrassed by opportunism uh, in the past. And I think uh, no longer India is going to be uh, sort of embarrassed by somebody calling it opportunism. Right. Let me broaden this out. Um, Vijay and Rajiv, what's your response to what we've heard Ashish say? Because one of the things I'd like to drive is one of the mysteries to me is for why an economy of 1.4 billion still does not have a significant number of multinationals playing in the global economy. It's still very much based and focused on the region or even domestically. Um, what's your view on that, Rajiv? Well, uh, if, if on that is changing, but what I certainly uh, would like to uh, highlight what she said, where I, where I am in full agreement with him, is that see the markets really predict in a way the future, right? And the markets when they are buoyant, it means that people uh, who are the market players and both domestic and global market players, right? They are expecting good returns to come from the Indian market. And they are buying, uh, I think they bought uh, during the pandemic period, correct me if I'm wrong, Ashish, the FII, the foreign institutional investors, have invested something like 38 billion US dollars, right? And India, the FDI has been a little lower, but the combined uh, uh, FDI plus FII into India has been a record high. Right, and therefore the rupee is very strong. It should be much, much weaker than in in real terms than it is, because our exports are not doing so well. But you know what Ashish is saying 
the markets being buoyed, it is because people and people in India and globally are expecting India to do wonderful things. So to that extent, completely agree. And completely just to add to that, uh, yeah, just to add to that, I don't say that markets uh, are going to show the reality forever, right? So they may come down. That doesn't mean that India is going to do badly. If they go up, uh, that doesn't mean India is going to do well. For me, India is going to do well irrespective of markets doing well. Yeah, but our GDP is also going to go up, Ashish. That's what, that's, what that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it, it cannot be that basically market has gone down, so you were opportunistic. No. If markets go down, even in US they go down, it doesn't yeah. matter at all. Well, let me broaden this out because Prakash Pinduja has, has, um, has, has joined us. And I should say, I've got a question here from Stuart Hutton. How much are growth rates in India going to be affected by other major global economies seeing similar levels of growth? Uh, Prakash, welcome. Um, we're 20 minutes into the discussion at the moment. I'll come to you in a moment after we've heard from Vijay, but I'd like you to pick up um, the kind of themes that we've been developing about basically an optimism for the Indian economy and also for the global economy. Vijay, uh, just come in on what you've heard Ashish and Rajiv say? Well, comparing India with the European or American markets, per se, has been done for way too long. The advantage is China has looked elsewhere. and This has been its trend. Building its Belt and Silk Road initiative has opened up whole new markets to it. Both Africa and, and ASEAN, Southeast Asia, are, is in essence, neighbors to India, a natural playground for India, if not India's backyard. You know, ASEAN represents 600 million people with the world's fastest growing middle class. And this should be, and, and India's cultural legacy stretches all the way across ASEAN, both in terms of language as well as in terms of trade. India's trend prior to colonization has always been in how it has, you know, basically stamped or imprinted, you know, its legacy across the world through openness, through trade, through it. Towards, you know, it was never an, uh, through invasion, but it always through trade. So ASEAN is a natural development for India. It makes sense for India to build platforms, trading platforms with Africa, with, you know, Asia, Southeast Asia, and from there to keep on building it across the world. You know, building it with the U.S. and Europe alone uh, as a strategy is going to be a a totally different new norm, as it were. It's going to be a totally different play because both the U.S. and the EU have different uh, fundamental strategies in mind when it comes to this. Vijay, QI is based in Hong Kong and and KL. You're Indian yourself. Do you feel that the Indian economy is open enough? And then I'm going to come to Prakash on that. It, it, to underestimate the Indian economy would be, uh, you know, a, a loss to anyone. It, is, it has got the greatest potential of any nation on, on the planet. Having said that, can the Indian economy open up a lot more? Absolutely. The question you asked, Nick, was why is there not enough Indian multinationals across the globe? Likewise, the reverse question would be why are there not enough multinationals coming into India? So well, they look. They look at Vodafone. They look at Cairn, and they look at the the problems and the, the having having heard promises ten, fifteen years ago, a feeling that they get caught in a trap, which becomes a very costly trap. I agree. And uh, but moving ahead, no, I think new... let me no. Let me give you a rebuttal to that. It's also the way to malign India and run away with all the not paying the duties. So uh, Cairn and both, uh, especially Vodafone. It's basically whenever you want to run away, you start maligning the country. So for me, if you want to play fair, India is a good market. If you don't want to play fair, but use uh, the foreign media to sort of malign India, then there is a problem. But can I just be clear, Rashi? I mean, with Cairn, they were awarded 1.7 billion, and they're now trying to work out how to get it back. In other words, there was a decision in the, in Cairn's favor. Fair, fair, and there is basically at some point in time it will work out whichever way. But that cannot be. To malign India, you give two I'm examples. Not maligning, 200, I'm not maligning. Yeah, it looks like, but basically, for 200 uh, other companies like Oracle, Microsoft, everyone is working in India. There is no problem at all. So my understanding is just by Tom Tomming because it's Vodafone, it can do nothing wrong, or because it is Kane, it's nothing wrong. Or, although it might have done wrong, but if the thing is in their favor, it should be paid. What I'm trying to tell you is somewhere in the line. Two examples, and the other side is 2,000 examples. You continue to harp on that again and again and again every time to malign 
that don't come to india for me that is not a fair perspective right Prakash, uh, what's your view uh, as an international uh, investor? Welcome. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining thank you, us. Nice, thank you. Thank you, Nick. It's nice we, to hear you. And I'm, we've only got 15 minutes left, unfortunately. But yes, can you thank just you very much. I want to give you are an international to, investor. Yes, we are an international investor. And I, uh, I follow up with the view what uh, you see Ashish is saying. I support his views because he has been uh, very active in Bombay Stock Exchange. And he has brought a lot of changes, which has brought a lot of investments in India as well. And I could see that the changes in the new reforms, which have already happened in a big way, and it has to be done in a further also in these new reforms have to be bring in so that the more investments can come in India in a big way. For example, we are, you see, I'm, uh, we are living in unprecedented times. The pandemic has left no country untouched. Developed India is no exception. And I would say the future of India is fantastic. And our group who has been investing in India from the time of last, I would say, going back into 75 years of India's democracy, which has taken place after the independence, our growth in India has been tremendous. And we still are investing in India in a big way. There may be problems. Every country you invest, you have different problems are taking place. But we have to face with them. And we have to solve problems. As they say, slow and steady wins the race. But compared to China, if you see the Americans, the British, the EU countries have seen China and invested in China and giving a lot of technology to them, which they have not done in India yet. But now they are moving towards India. Why they are moving towards India? They have gained experience in China. But now they see that India is a better market for the near future. I would always mention that take the India needs uh, you know, the vaccination of India for this has been fantastic. And they have done tremendous progress during this time of COVID. We were the largest vaccination producers in India. And I will tell you that the plan which India has been going on with the technology and the different manpower and the skill India is uh, India's manpower, the Americans, the British, everybody is benefiting from India's skill. The brains of India are one of the best in the world today. If you see the American companies all around in U.S. and in Britain, the best of the brains you'll find are from India who are taking care of it. Now, very soon you'll find those young new generation who are being educated in America or in Cambridge or in Stanford, Walton and Harvard, they will come back to India and you'll find the new India in a big way. The population. Do, do, of do India, you believe there will be significant global uh, Indian based corporations who are becoming right. international? Because right. uh, the point I was making is, uh, OK, there are there are some some are very successful. But it's right. still remarkable that for such success, right. there isn't a massive global footprint for Indian corporations right. at the moment. Right. And, and India, is, uh, India is going to be international for sure. And I'm confident about this because the way the different technologies are coming in in India and the new changes are coming in. Prime Minister Modi is bringing in new reforms, the new changes where it is attracting more and more investments in India are happening. But if could they be see, fast enough? Could they be faster? Yeah, it can be, of course. I'm going to say if the reforms move faster, the investment will come in India in a big way. So we All are right, waiting. Well, we've got 15 minutes left. Let me just quote you what Tushar Desai has said. He's head of business development. I don't know where. Indians have a big mindset issue. Few investors Many don't really have a role to play, Ashish. They just invest. If India is to grow, it has to fund industry and not just have share markets. Do you think that's a fair representation, Ashish? Uh, in a way, uh, I'll just give you the numbers. Uh, on the financial year 2020-21, uh, 
the foreigners invested by portfolio that is what you mentioned around 38 billion dollars but foreigners invested 81 billion dollars uh, in india in foreign direct uh, investment i mean of course we have a ambition to bring trillion dollars a year so that's why we are falling short by a lot but 81 uh, billion dollars is almost uh, 25 30% increase compared to the previous year and why i'm telling you this is uh, basically what india does is gives you huge value by putting very little capital so you, although you may put 81 billion dollars uh, the money you are able to take out is huge the profits you are able to make is much larger which is not true with another competition of india which is china i think uh, uh, mr induja mentioned uh, but uh, effectively uh, india today uh, due to its it uh, infrastructure it, its it manpower and also pharmaceuticals it's able to give you on a very little uh, input huge amount of output so what you need to worry about is outputs more than the inputs that doesn't mean that inputs are not going up 81 billion dollars is not a small amount it's a great growth and despite whatever uh, earlier you mentioned about uh, vodafone and other things uh, and so that's where basically people are actually getting uh, a lot of trust in the way india is working over last 30 years today is actually the uh, 30th year uh, completion of india's uh, reforms or liberalization and we have come a long way i have no doubt uh, we have issues it's not that we are the best but we are not the worst and people are coming despite whatever uh, we may feel ourselves sometimes we are also uh, basically uh, uh, having that inferiority complex that when somebody attacks us we keep on uh, not even rebutting that and all right well, let, 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 let me press you on a question i put i think before both you ashish and also um uh, prakash you joined me um about where wealth is going to come from where wealth is going to be generated 1% of the population controls 45% of the wealth in india where is the wealth going to come from uh, uh vj you are dealing very much in consumer and retail uh, rajiv as well you are doing it in different way what about the distribution of wealth which is going to generate much more wealth within india how do you see that developing uh, vj first first of all i'd like to um, agree with uh, ashish ji as well as prakash ji that india is arguably the greatest engine of growth for the new millennium and to uh, align oneself with india is a lot more smart than to malign it so if one were to align ourselves with india the objective here would be to understand how uh, this engine of growth can be fueled and fdi in some form or another is the ideal way whereby this can actually uh, india's uh, economic growth would ex- explode exponentially now that means the playing field has to be even it has to be as simple for a international firm to come into india and invest in india as it is to invest in south asia or invest in europe for that matter and that means that uh, actually the, the current government has moved taken many great strides ahead compared to where india was india has moved forward uh, virtually you know in a in a ballistic fashion it's amazing how india has uh grown so far so soon in this regard the license raj which was its biggest problem you know a decade ago has to a great extent been reduced but uh the fact remains your your critical point which i think you said earlier and which you asked prakash can it be faster and therein lies the actual uh challenge the answer is yes it can be faster and it will be faster definitely Let me Please tell you, you know, the, the startups that are coming today, Nick and, and Vijay, and of course, I think Prakash and uh, Ashish, and Ashish will particularly know much more about it, they're doing phenomenally well. India today has got the third largest number of startups coming up. You have, on average, two or three startups coming up every year, every day, sorry, every day. That's a phenomenal number. You have something between 50,000 and 60,000 startups. and one of the original startups has had a great debut on on ashish's uh, sort of stock exchange it's called uh, zomato right uh, similarly you have another startup called ola which which is like uh, uber all right so ola in india is now based on their success and their ability to mobilize both domestic and global capital is going to put up it has begun putting up not going to put up has begun putting up the largest two wheeler electric uh, uh, ev 
EV plant, two wheeler, the capacity is going to be something like five million a year, right? So you know India is moving, and this is where the new jobs are going to come from. The new jobs are going to come from the service industry, from the IT industry, from the pharma industry, and then downstream, which is the logistics. This and is that going to create yeah. enough wealth? Is that going to generate significant yes, new wealth? Because if you look at the guys who are driving these scooters to to delay to do delivery, these delivery boys, they're driving scooters. They're also driving bicycles, the ordinary you know uh, two wheeler bicycles where you pedal, right? Their their standard of living is going up. Unfortunately, what's happened, Nick, because of the pandemic and because of the lockdowns, something like maybe. 10 million to 15 million people lost their jobs, but those jobs are already being made up. And uh, CMIE, which is one of the most respected uh, uh, research uh, and monitoring companies in India, they have shown how the loss of jobs has come down and the recovery has begun in terms perhaps, of jobs. Perhaps so the, the growing up, you will find that the jobs will come. I Did agree. You? Perhaps it's not just about you know bringing the world to India. It's also about bringing India to the world, and that's something that needs to be focused upon big. And that is a very strong way of driving foreign investment. Bringing India to the world is powerful. Taking Indian products, you you yourself pointed out a little while ago, Nick. The exports were not where it needs to be. I agree. And the it's names, India. absolutely. And that I, that I, is strategizing. Ashish, we've only got three minutes left. Nick, Ashish, I will, uh, you... uh, Nick, I will explain you one thing very important. What you mentioned about the SME companies is the biggest growth which has a future in India. And these SME companies are going to bring a lot of new jobs. And you have a lot of financing going on. Our group, Hinduja group, is focused on many of these SME, SME companies like Ashok Leland to today. We have a lot of exports going on to the African countries and our SMEs are, we are financing a lot of SME companies in giving them leasing. We are contributing a lot into the agriculture division. Agriculture is going to be a big growth in India. Still, agriculture is not recognized as an industry in India. America, agriculture is recognized as an industry. And I would request the government of India especially that how agriculture should be transformed into a form of an industry where the 67 percent of the population is in the rural area and the growth of those 67 percent from the rural area will increase in such a tremendous way that the growth of india is all depends on them Right. And how and now, look, we have that? we have two minutes left. So what I'd like to do is issue a challenge to each of you, of the four of you, in thirty seconds, summarize where you think India will be, not in fifty years' time, but in five years' time. Even allowing for the climate emergency, but give me a sense. And I've done this many times myself in India, asking for a prediction, asking for a, uh, for a, for a, a framing of where we we can expect India to be. Let me ask each of you in no more than thirty seconds, please. A big challenge. Challenge, Rajiv. India will be ahead of Germany in terms of GDP. That's one. Our per capita income, which is two thousand dollars per person today, will be nearing three thousand dollars. Let me rest. BJ, I've always believed in India awakening, and this is about Indian, uh, the Indians, basically bringing India to the world. And just to paraphrase another great Indian, when India awakens, the planet will tremble. I feel, <laughs> I feel the next couple of years is where it could happen with the right, with the right attitude and political will. Absolutely. Ash Ashish, among your members and those quoted on your exchange, do you see a significant move towards international India? Yes, and um, basically just to add to uh, his last uh, statement that people will tremble with happiness and not with fear when India rises, <laughs> unlike, unlike China. So, right? so people will not be afraid of India uh, and that still will be rising, although uh, when you are people are not afraid, they can kick you hard. Uh, but uh, despite that, India also has in a right place at the right time for uh, what I call capitalism without capital. 
earlier india was capital starved which it still is and it was very difficult to make more capital or more wealth without adding more capital now all right well, that, well, right and that's what over next 5 years india will uh, as uh, i agree with uh, rajiv ji that it's going to be close to 5 trillion dollars economy and uh, right. the third, third largest in the world well ashish um, i'm trembling with delight as you've encouraged me to do <laughs> so that's tremendous uh, and um, uh, prakash do you are you trembling with delight do you tremble with delight every day because of the prospects now for india oh yes i am very much positive for what all are they saying but i would only say that we need the technology to come to india china has seen the peak now that peak is over very soon you will find india is going to reach to that peak and and this is the time where this last next next 5 years or 7 years whatever you can say india is going to be number 1 in the world All right. Well, look. I've been given another five minutes because it's going so well. How is that technology going to come, and the skills and the education? Because that's what China has done very effectively. And as you said yourself, Prakash, uh, with Wharton, with uh, Stanford, with so many other uh, great uh, schools, that India is now to, India. The next generation is benefiting from that. Where is the the new technological skill going to come from? Because you have an incredible amount of technological skill already, surely. yeah we are already bringing in different different technology in our industry like like programs of digitalization you see india is going to be digitalized in a big way and it is already the progress is going on take example of renewable energy our company ashok leland is having 75% using our own renewable energy of the technology which we have developed in india india stands number 1 with renewable energy in the world which we are going to give to offer to the african world african not quite country. yet not quite yet no but it will happen this is in the process and this is in the process that you will see right. that big names are going to be in an african country we of example we have gone into the african can- countries in past 5 years the growth in african countries have happened from our indian industries over there Now, Rajiv, you've shown me your clock, but I've got another four minutes. They've given me. No, no, no. I, I didn't show you my clock. I, I showed you my mobile. That's how the education gap is going to be filled up. That's what I was wanting to say. I thought you were telling me to stop. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the this is the device which is going to change and is already changing significantly. Yeah, the, the face of India. There are more than five hundred uh, smart devices now, right? Five hundred million. And these are being shared. amongst the poor people amongst the poor children to go to school right a company i don't know if you heard of another startup called byju right now byju is sweeping in the other education set, uh, sector and there are many many others have come in that is changing you know primary education phenomenally right they are doing it in the regional languages right so i think this is one thing which is going to change the education sector in india DJ I think it cannot be done simply from bottom down I mean the big companies the multinationals are not going to be driving this the SMEs as as it was discussed earlier is really the fundamental engine of growth China basically opened up the Chinese diaspora tapping into Taiwan Macau Hong Kong at the time getting into Southeast Asia tapping into the Chinese populations in Indonesia and Singapore and uh, bringing in the technology from these places bringing in the capital from these places tying up into various partnerships with these places turn china around booking sui the former deputy prime minister of singapore ended up in his final years sitting in china driving that strategy so china opened its markets in its mind to this diaspora the indian diaspora is indians india's greatest treasure The Indian diaspora doesn't just live in the US. You see, the Indians are just used to looking at the NRI diaspora. The fact of the matter is, there is a major Indian diaspora that's ethnically Indian that is sitting in Southeast Asia, in Fiji, in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Mauritius, and they are fundamentally loyal to India. And what drives trade is not just policy; it's attitude. So here we have. a uh, uh, waiting indian diaspora waiting to develop and bring in the capital bring in the technology bring in skill sets you know and trade is a two way street so india should just 
recognize the diaspora. This could be its greatest secret, the treasure that is waiting to basically, you know, bring to the surface. All right, we're talking about treasure and trembling with delight. Actually, final word from you. SMEs, what's the survivability of SMEs at the moment in India? How well are they doing? How quickly do they get investment? How quickly do they, they really um, generate enormous wealth quickly? Or is it yeah, too easy to talk about startups? Yes. Basically, the way we look at it is uh, that everyone will not get the money irrespective. Nowhere everyone gets the money just because they have ideas, just because they call themselves SMEs. But uh, India today is much better, uh, even at institutional level like stock markets. Today, if you want to raise even 200,000 US dollars, you can raise from BSE. There is no other country in the world uh, which does the raising of funds so cheaply. Because if you have to list a company on a stock exchange, it costs you 10, 15 million dollars. In India, it costs you literally 5 million rupees, uh, which is uh, basically uh, less than a million uh, or less than 100,000 US dollars. And that's where we have raised it to that level. We have so many incubators coming up that the small little 100,000 rupees people, people who need 100,000 rupees or 200,000 rupees, are also getting that money from third parties, uh, investing in their businesses. And that's where uh, I agree with Rajiv's perspective that today uh, India is creating so many new businesses and they're getting funding. It doesn't mean that they will continue to get funding if they continue to remain uh, loss making. But India today uh, is actually buzzing with uh, energy and many of those uh, companies have world as their market, not only India as their market, uh, like Ola he mentioned. And now they are uh, basically getting into uh, electric uh, scooters, uh, that is the two wheelers and things like that. And they are trying to uh, go to the rest of the world, also in addition to being in India. And so that's where our youngsters are much more agile, uh, much more ambitious than we were in our generation. And I'm uh, delighted for that. <laughs> All right. I hope, you're I hope you're trembling with delight as well, Ashish. Thank you very much indeed, all four of you. I should, I should tell you there are a couple of comments here. I love the positive outlook here, says one comment. And there's another question about taking ESG seriously and managing investment for positive impact. But I have to say, regrettably, that's for another day or another session. Thank you all very much indeed to Rajiv, to Vijay, to Ashish and Prakash. I'm sorry uh, if there were connection problems at the beginning, but I've really enjoyed speaking to you and thank you very much indeed. And certainly here where I am in London, we haven't had a thunderstorm, which was, was what I was expecting. So um, I'm sitting here dry and we are still connected, which is fantastic. And when I think of what it was like in India about 10 years ago, when one couldn't have a Zoom conversation, this is marvellous. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, I'm delighted thank you, that we have had a positive impact, and I'm trembling with delight. And I wish you luck for, for the future. We look yeah, forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.